you're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Body Banter. I am Shagun Yedele, and I am co- coming to you from Kelowna in the uns- unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation. As usual, with me is Claudia. Hi, everyone. My name is Claudia Krebs, joining you from the ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the UBC Vancouver campus. We have a very special guest today. Um, He is a mentor, a master educator, and a beloved teacher here at UBC, and one of our favorite colleagues, Wayne Vogel. So nice to have you here on the podcast. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Claudia. So you've been teaching anatomy for a long time. Tell us your journey into anatomy and what fascinates you about it. So it's sort of interesting. I have sort of a mixed um, past in terms of anatomy and how I ended up um, teaching in an anatomy department. But I started my my graduate training in a zoology department, actually, and I, I did my PhD on the comparative anatomy of the vascular supply to two species of uh, toothed whales, the narwhal and beluga in the Canadian Arctic. And uh, while I was doing that degree, it, um, it became apparent to me and to my supervisor that I really needed to understand the vocabulary and language of anatomy, which the only place that that was really taught was in medical school. So as a graduate student, um, my supervisor arranged for me to um, take the medical gross anatomy course. And it's sort of interesting, the only um, vertebrate or animal in which anatomy was taught in depth uh, is actually the human uh, in medical school. Uh, Even veterinary schools don't teach the level of anatomy that's taught in human anatomy in medical school. So anyway, I entered the the first year medical uh, class as an anatomy student. And um, that was my first exposure to human gross anatomy. And it, it was sort of interesting. The first lecture I attended was on the axilla and the person, which is basically the armpit. And the person who gave the lecture gave the lecture with no notes and they did all their diagrams on the blackboard. And I just found it absolutely thrilling and amazing that somebody could could do that and actually transmit that level of knowledge in a in a really easy and comfortable way. So I was so excited after that lecture and the following lab that I knew that that's the direction I, I wanted to go in. And that's after cool. my um, doctoral training, I uh, did my uh, postdoctoral training at the Harvard Medical School in the anatomy department. So that's where I began to train as a cell biologist in an anatomy department. And while I was there, I actually got to give a lecture, my first lecture in gross anatomy I gave as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard on um, cranial cavity and contents to the first year medical students. So that that was where I actually started my my formal career as an anatomist, I suppose. That's so great. And you still do that lecture on the cranial cavity and its contents here at UBC, and it is still a fabulous lecture. And so the anatomist that you learned from here, that was Sidney Friedman, who did his uh, chalkboard drawings, right? And um, just for those who ever want to visit the UBC campus, the Friedman building now houses the physiotherapy um, department. And the chalkboards in that 
lecture theater are um, amazing. So Friedman had them special commissioned for that lecture theater, and they are the best chalkboards on campus, I would say. I regret I no longer lecture in that lecture theater. It's, um, it's a real treat to use that chalkboard, and especially with the history behind it. Yeah, it's very interesting, those chalkboards. Um... So I'm old enough that uh, I come from a generation where we didn't have all the, the PowerPoints and computer technologies. So everything was done on blackboards and using 35 millimeter slides for, um, for the IT. But uh, the blackboards, it's very interesting. When I started to lecture, all of my lectures as a first year faculty member were on the head and neck. And nobody else wanted to do them. That's why I ended up with them. And they were all, all the areas that I really, really enjoy um, teaching as, uh, as an anatomist. But Dr. Friedman used to sit right at the back of the lecture hall. And he would keep tabs on all the junior faculty members and, and all the senior faculty members as well. And he would come down and tutor us on how to um, use the blackboard and use shading and this sort of thing. And you can do things with soft chalk on those glass blackboards that you can't do on the modern fiber boards. Um, they're absolutely amazing. You could do three-dimensional diagrams that would just bounce off the, the uh, blackboards at you. That's so lovely to hear, Wayne. And, uh... I mean, I can just, I can hear the enthusiasm and the joy of teaching still in your voice and, and your expression. For those of you who will be listening to this uh, via uh, podcast, uh, I can actually see Wayne as he's speaking. Um, to follow up on what you say about the head and neck, uh, and as Claudia said, you still teach those lectures. Um, and what a fabulous series of lectures they are. I mean, I... I can recite some of your lines <laughs> about the <laughs> about the um, the autonomics the, of the head and neck, uh, but I'm not going <laughs> to go in there. But I, you know, I'm just trying to trace that back to the to your graduate studies where you did the uh, the, the study of the whales, and I'm wondering, and and the what you are really looking for were the comparative anatomy and. And, and is there any lessons learned? Is there anything that uh, is similar uh, about human anatomy and the um, whale anatomy in terms of their head and neck anatomy? Uh, can we learn anything uh, from, from your studies? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the really interesting things about an anatomy, which I've always found interesting, is that learning anatomy in minute detail um, seems a little tedious when you're doing it, but that level of detail allows you to see patterns in other vertebrates that really, I think, are quite amazing. And um, one of the interesting things to me is that um, in the toothed whales, um, the way they basically visualize the world is an audio uh, way. Uh, rather than a visual way or a touch way, they they see things sort of with their um, with their ears, and they use a, a really interesting method of of getting um, sounds back to the to the ear so that they can visualize the world. And one of the ways they do it is um, transmitting sounds through their lower jaw, through uh, acoustic fat that's in their lower jaw. And there's a little ligament that goes from the lower jaw actually all the way up to the malleus. And that, um, that connection of the fat pad to the malleus, you can trace back and look to see uh, in humans that the, that sort of connection is still there. And that connection relates to the evolutionary history of the uh, jaw suspension and the development of the middle ear bones. And when I was doing human anatomy, I sort of was doing a dissection of a, 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 of a small whale at the same time and did that um, dissection uh, in, the, in the whale and verified that connection of that mandibular fat to the, um, to the malleus. So I think, I think learning anatomy in that level of detail in a human, what it does to me is just really reinforce the evolutionary history of, of vertebrates. Well, My that's... mind is blown, right? 
Like, that's amazing. I didn't realize that my mandible was directly connected to my inner ear. And that shows my lineage with whales. That's, yes. I'm going to carry that all day with me. This is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's true even of other systems. So um, it, it's really interesting. So whales actually developed from a land vertebrate and they went back to the water. So they, their respiratory system and digestive tract um, had been modified as, you know, vertebrates entered terrestrial or land-based um, uh, environments, but they carry that with them back into the ocean. And so they had to remodify and um, develop their systems further um, to accommodate that. So all their entire bodies changed as they went back into the water, which I just find absolutely amazing. <clears throat> so over the course of about 40 million years, they've changed from a uh, uh, or 50 million years from a land vertebrate to a water vertebrate to what you see now swimming in the, in the ocean, which I find amazing. This is so fascinating and, and amazing uh, to me to, to hear as well. And, and perhaps it's probably timely that we're having this discussion just because of, um, you know, the change in climates in the world and how these uh, animals are really like these days are an endangered species. And, uh, and and if you could give a message out there to, to people listening and maybe there will be some politician or somebody influential <laughs> listening, you know, um, from from your from what you've learned about the anatomy, about the, the lifestyle and, and about the history of these animals, you know, maybe just an opportunity to say how how precious they are and how much a resource they are to, to all humans and the fact that we, we need to keep them around for, for a long time. Yeah, it's really interesting. The um, Recently, I've been working with um, a group that's been studying mysticity whales and a particular group of the baleen whales called the roquals. And these are the ones that lunge feed they go after large uh, volumes of krill and actually the amount of water and prey they take into their oral cavity um, is huge, larger than the, the whale's body itself, which is quite amazing. Uh, and it's, these animals are so highly differentiated uh, and specific to what they feed on that if, for example, krill disappeared from the ocean, um, these animals, there's no going back. They actually depend on krill. So they, you know, if krill disappeared, those whales would also all disappear. Uh, and to give you an example of how um, differentiated they are, their esophagus, even though they can reach 70 feet, 80 feet in length, some of the, the larger whales, their esophagus is no bigger around than that, um, to give you an idea. And they, their whole system is designed, they've lost all their teeth and they have baleen. So their whole system is designed to prey on that, those small prey organisms. And if they disappear, the whales disappear because they, they can't, you know, there wouldn't be enough time for them to evolve other systems. And they're so terminally differentiated that they are and, and so highly derived that they would not be able to um, to um, survive. Some of the other whales, tooth whales, for example, so they would probably be able to switch prey atoms from the ones that they currently feed on to others. But the the Rokwa whales would be, you know, would be really endangered. So that really points to the connectedness on this planet and sort of the kinship between organisms, right? So we have, you know, obviously relationships within the ecosystem. And um, but if I bring it back to our anatomy, I'm really fascinated by your description of the shared anatomy between whales and humans. Mm -hmm. And obviously, our anatomy is specialized for the environment that we thrive in. But um, Tell us a little bit about your journey towards human anatomy, starting from the whales, and in particular, the anatomy of the head and neck, which is, of course, very specialized in the whales as they take in these large volumes of water to feed on the krill, um, which we obviously don't. Tell us more about that. 
Sure. So it, it's really interesting. The um, the all of the whales have certain modifications depending on the group. Uh, modifications that allow them to live in the water. And one of them is is related uh, to the separation of breathing and uh, digestive tracts. So we're um, what you would call continuous breathers. We, we breathe all the time in cycles. And the separation, we have to separate our um, respiratory tract from our digestive tract when we swallow, for example, to make sure that food goes down the right pathway. And embryologically, the, the respiratory tract develops as an outpocketing of the digestive tract. So uh, in anatomy, the respiratory tract is connected to your um, digestive tract as an adult. So in a good example of that, for example, you can open your mouth and breathe through your mouth at the same time. Uh, so it, it's sort of interesting. You can breathe through your mouth. Uh, and when they put feeding tubes in the hospital into you, they actually do it through your nasal cavity down into your stomach. So those, those two pathways are connected, and we have to have a way, a system of valves that separate them. And it's sort of interesting. What the whales have done is actually taken uh, their voice box, uh, and this is specific to the tooth whales, and they've actually modified it into a, a, a tube that actually goes directly up and passes right into the nasal cavities. So these um, animals, which are not continuous breathers, they breathe only when they're at the surface. So they're discontinuous breathers or periodic breathers. They spend most of their time underwater. So when they breathe, that, that tube is actually stuck in the posterior part of their nasal cavities, and there's a sphincter that holds it into position. And uh, so when they swallow, their, their pathway is, is completely separate from their respiratory pathway, and the food goes around their, their uh, larynx into the esophagus, which is very interesting. Um, and the same in mysticity whales, there it's a little bit different. Um, they retract their um, larynx sort of into the floor of their digestive tract and completely seal it when they, uh, they swallow. But the interesting thing is the anatomy, if you know the human anatomy in detail, you can actually work out the anatomy and see the similarities uh, between the whales and how they've modified um, from human anatomy, for example, or terrestrial anatomy. This is also fascinating, and uh, I can't help but feel that I, I'm geeking out here with, with, with you. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm trying to relate this to something I, I think you've mentioned before in one of your lectures on the head and neck, and this is about infants and infants and neonates, especially in their um, when they're you know eat uh, with suckling. Mm -hmm. For example, when they're suckling, they are also able to breathe at the same time as they suckle. Is there yeah. a relationship to is there a relationship to what you've been describing about whales? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So most most mammals, their um, larynx is very closely related to the the soft palate, which is one of those valves that we talked about uh, in terms of separating your respiratory from your digestive tract. And in humans you, the, that are particularly in infants, the larynx is just above the soft palate. So the food, just like in the odontocetes, goes around the larynx rather than um, the larynx closing. And so they can breathe and suckle at the same time. And as, as we grow and our voice and vocalization language develops, the larynx actually descends uh, to a lower position in the neck, which is very characteristic of, of Homo sapiens, that descent of the, uh, the larynx as we develop. So in us, it's very essential that we have a number of valves to make sure that nothing gets in our airway when we swallow. And it's sort of interesting, if you take a glass of water uh, and fill your oral cavity or mouth with water, um, you can actually breathe with the water in your, your mouth. But as soon as you go to swallow it, you stop breathing. 
And that's because your lower airway completely seals or the upper part of the lower airway completely seals to prevent the, the liquid from um, getting into the respiratory tract as you swallow. And hopefully that works normally all the time, but, <laughs> but things sometimes go wrong, right? <laughs> I love all of these adaptations that we've had to make to make our anatomy work, it's in particular in the head and neck. I feel like um, it's such a perilous area. We breathe, we eat, um, we communicate with our head and neck. It seems like it's really where everything is happening that um, is core to our humanity, really, right? Like our connection, our communication and, and all of that. Um, and the fascinating piece is how we can trace that across species and across uh, sort of the evolutionary tree. Um, and so that commonality and that sort of kinship that we have with other mammals, other vertebrates, um, and, and really a lot of um, other animals. In your work, I know you um, traveled to the Arctic a lot um, during your studies uh, to dissect whales. What was one of the coolest moments uh, for you uh, during that time, um, either just from an experience perspective or from an anatomy perspective? So uh, from an anatomy perspective, one of the, the things that really had an impact on me when I was first studying this was I went up to the Arctic as an undergraduate doing some field work um, for uh, one of the jobs I was doing at the time. And when um, I would go out with hunting parties uh, up there, when they would go out, and they, they still domestically harvest um, uh, the indigenous population in the Arctic. They um, domestically harvest uh, whales for, for meat. And it, one of the things I noticed when they were butchering the animals was this whole series of blood vessels that lies behind the lungs, sort of um, outside where the cavity is that, that contains the lungs. And it looked to me like a whole bunch of parasites in there. And actually, it wasn't parasites. It was actually blood vessels. And this is before I knew much anatomy. And I was, I was actually struck by this because I'd never seen any, anything like this in any of the comparative anatomy I had done in courses and, and this sort of thing. So when I came back, I did an honors degree uh, with uh, a, a person in zoology. And that eventually led to my, my graduate work and a more in-depth study of that system of blood vessels. And it turns out that, that uh, we actually just recently worked out what all of those blood vessels do. And what they actually do is prevent um, pressure pulses from reaching the central nervous system. Uh, and they, they, they equalize the pulses in arteries and veins uh, that result from the animal swimming in a dorsal ventral fluking sort of way. And it, it's sort of interesting, those blood vessels actually protect the central nervous system against mechanical damage because of, of, of pressure pulses in the vascular system. And we've just recently worked all of that out. So that's one of the more fascinating um, things that happened. The other, the other thing that I was, was that really impact, had an impact on me was being exposed to a different culture and a different environment. And at the time that I was, was doing that as an undergraduate, this was in the early 70s, 1970s, so a long time ago. Um, it, was, it was very interesting going out with hunting parties and that were still basically hunter and gatherer cultures. Uh, and and uh, it, to me, that had a big impact on me because I was raised in a, you know, a small community in Coquitlam, and I had never been on a plane before even. And so even getting on an aircraft to travel to that different environment, a di different cultural setting, had a, had a really strong impact on me uh, as a younger person. It's amazing to me how science and humanity always walk hand in hand how you know the, the your hosts if i if i put it that way when you started out um 
contributed to your science, contributed to your learning, and and left lasting impact on you. And that's that's to me is a, just a beautiful story. Um, and just to return for one minute about um, the to the whales. Um, so you've talked about how, and it's a fascinating thing how they are able to equalize their the the, the pressure within their blood vessels um, as a result of the fact that they travel and swim in a particular way so that the, the blood pressure is the same uh, across their body mass, which is huge. I'm wondering, you know, it just occurred to me when you were, uh, and I don't know whether you uh, you studied this at all, so please feel free to let me know if you did not. Okay. Um, that, you know, that submarines, when, when submarines go really that low, and even humans that do deep dive, one thing that they have to cope with is the pressure, you know, and so I'm wondering yeah. how, how are whales adapted to withstanding so much pressure in at those depths of the sea? So one of the one of the big problems is whales um, usually dive on a inspiration. So they're they're basically the respiratory system is full of air. And one of the problems you get into as you dive is that air compresses, whereas, you know, water and liquid and bone, that doesn't compress, right? So what you have are all of these, these compressible air spaces that you have to deal with. And whales have developed systems to accommodate the, the change in volume uh, of, uh, of the air as they dive. For example, in uh, the Rokal whales, which are these lunge feeding whales that I talked about earlier, they actually have um, soft tissue plugs that fill the upper nasal uh, passages and probably protrude further down into the nasal passages as the airways collapse. And they have other systems. They have a great big muscular sac the, associated with their uh, Adam's apple. Um, so the, the upper part of the lower airway. And the structure of their larynx is such that that sac can actually fill the larynx as the airways are compressed. Uh, and then the lungs themselves. So if you go down, you know, very, very deeply in the, in the water, they will, um, uh, they will collapse, of course, the lungs. And so the rest of their system, their, their uh, ribs and abdomen and that position of the diaphragm are such that they will allow the, uh, the, that collapsed airspace to be filled with, uh, with other structures as they dive. So it's quite amazing. Excellent. I mean, I mean, I could keep talking about this and asking yeah. questions for a long time, but let's um, let's talk about something else. And 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 maybe uh, we've talked about your journey into uh, teaching and then your uh, human teaching uh, medical students and mm -hmm. other types of students so far. And and I want to ask about the highlight because you're still going. <laughs> you're still and. Yeah. Uh, when, when I grow up, I really want to be like you because, <laughs> because you know, you're still going with the same passion and enthusiasm and, and, and joy and, 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 and expertise as well. So I, I just want to, what is the secret to Wayne Vogel's uh, <laughs> career? <laughs> so I think, I think you just have to basically enjoy what you're doing. Um, you know, and I do, I, I'm constantly fascinated by things I see. So even in the, you know, the gross anatomy lab, even after teaching for, you know, over 40 years, I still see things in the gross anatomy lab that are new and different. And uh, it's, you know, I find, I just find that exciting. And it's sort of interesting. What, what's happened recently is I've gotten involved with a group of, um, uh, biomechanics people in the zoology department here. And they were the people over the last 10 years who got me back into looking at whales. And uh, they were they started by looking at the, the actual biomechanics of how the, the jaw and blubber and this sort of thing is structured as these animals lunge feed. 
And as we've been doing that, we've been noticing all sorts of different things in their anatomy and that that have, have furthered, furthered the studies. And in fact, I started my graduate career looking at blood vessels in Narwhal and Beluga and looking at this so-called uh, REIT system. Uh, and just recently, I've gone back looking at that system in the Mystocidae mice wells, and we've actually figured out what it does. So after 40 years, we've, we've actually been able to work out what it does. So it's, for me, it's very, very gratifying. And it's sort of a, a cycle, full turnaround of, of things. Uh, I love it's, that. It's, 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 sorry, it's like this story of your, your first love, uh, the anatomy of the yes. whales, and then coming back to it through the power of collaboration, um, yeah. you know, finding colleagues on <laughs> campus with a similar passion, but with a different view and a different um, sort of lens and uh, question to the same problem. Um, it, it's wonderful. And I noticed that at the beginning, how a question that arose 40, 50 years ago um, had been with you all this time and now finally it's yeah. been solved and you were able to publish the paper that started uh with an undergrad in the arctic um, after his first plane ride so that's that's a really beautiful story yeah absolutely and it's sort of interesting this system this uh reedy mirabile system which is a system of blood vessels a network of uh blood vessels between these uh major blood vessels that supply your uh, body and the brain. So this system of blood vessels is interposed. And it, it was first noted in porpoises, um, you know, over 400 years ago. And it's perplexed anatomists for all of that time. And it's just recently we've been able to, to figure out what it's, uh, what it's doing. But it's interesting, the homologs of that system in other animals is related to uh, regulating temperature to the brain, not to regulating pressure pulses mainly. And it's interesting in us, uh, the major blood vessel or one of the major blood vessels that supplies the brain actually goes through a network of veins uh, in the cranial cavity, similar to what you see as a terminal part of this REIT system in the whale group. So it's it's sort of interesting. Uh, different animals have done different things with that uh, set of blood vessels, depending on uh, what their environmental niche is and what the requirements are. Oh my gosh. So I carry a part of that in my head as well. So the cavernous sinus is actually part of that reed system from whales. Yes. Okay, yes. now I'm, I have a connection between my mandible and my inner ear, and I hear <laughs> whale anatomy inside of my skull. This is so yes. beautiful. So I think it's safe to say that your favorite part of whale anatomy is probably this reed system. But when you look at human anatomy, what is your favorite body part? Favorite body part? Um, you know, I think my favorite body part, and this is probably going to surprise you, is palate, soft palate. Um, I find that absolutely amazing that it, you know, and it, it only has basically four major muscles uh, associated with it and on each side. And it, it functions, its, its function is absolutely essential to everything we do, uh, basically, to talking, to swallowing, to breathing. Um, you know, movements of that soft palate are so, so integral to, to what we do. Um, that it, to me, I, I think I would have to put that right up there as one of my favorite body parts. And then the next favorite body part would be the larynx, which is also involved in that same sort of system. My least favorite, <laughs> my least favorite body part, probably the sole of the foot. <laughs> And there's a number of reasons for that, but right? I think the reasons for that are historical, at least in, in my terms, um, in that when I did anatomy, when I trained as an anatomist, I did the traditional gross anatomy, which was basically 300 hours of scheduled anatomy time. And the anatomy we did last in the whole course was the sole of the foot. That's what we ended up with. And the course was so intensive by the time we got to the sole of the foot 
we had basically had enough and we were ready to finish. So the sole of the foot is always <laughs> sort of one of those areas in the body that I sort of always hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can all sympathize, I think, with that. We've had many folks name the foot as their least favorite. Actually, my least favorite body part is the toe. So um, I, I get it. <laughs> but I have to say um, that your favorite body part is the palate, and then your second favorite is the larynx, comes to no surprise to anyone who has attended your lecture on the palate. And I remember when I was a young postdoc and I sat in that lecture for the first time, it was the first time that I actually understood what was going on. So um, your passion for that body part shines through in all of your lectures. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I, I can certainly echo those sentiments and uh, to say that um, yeah, I'm not surprised at all that it all comes back to the head and neck for for you and uh, and 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 we we are beneficiaries of your years and years of dedication and and uh, and passion for for the subject and and so well, all that remains is to say thank you very much, uh, Prof. Wayne, um, about uh, joining us today <laughs> and. Uh, helping us to tease out all these issues about um, the body uh, with specifically the will and then human anatomy as well. And, and so Claudia, any last? Just thank you very much. And I'm so happy that your question from 50 years ago has been answered and published. <laughs> that is something that all scientists aspire to that those questions get solved. So congratulations on that. And thanks so much for joining us. It's been a real treat to explore uh, our kinship with whales. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>